The Angry Chicken is a production of AMove TV. Bookmark AMove.tv for more gaming and esports shows. The Angry Chicken is directly supported by listeners like you via patreon.com slash TAC. podcast about Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. This is the Angry Chicken. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Angry Chicken with me, Garrett Weinzerl, him, Willie Dills Gregory, Gregory, I can't talk today, and her, Jocelyn Moffat. I, uh, if you're watching the video, I don't have my lights on because I am feeling rather awful, um, so uh, I'm not gonna sit here and sweat. I'm gonna. I'm just. I'm just relaxing with my comfy Hearthstone shirt, which this is, by the way, one of the <gasps> softest T-shirts I've ever we owned. Match. Oh <laughs> shoot! Aww, Jocelyn I and I. Ah, now, uh, now wear a stupid black shirt. This is just <laughs> like when I showed up the prom and that other girl named Jocelyn was wearing the same dress. <laughs> well, one of us has to change. <laughs> I, uh, f- all right, all right. Shirt's coming up. One sec. <laughs> oh, oh, some Garrett nipple. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's fun uh, for the video audience. Maybe less so for the uh, for the audio. Uh, how how are you all doing this week, Jocelyn? You know, what's what's new? How's how, are you? Are you? How's uh, I don't know. I'm trying to come up with a joke, and I was I was almost going to say, <laughs> "How's rank twenty? Did that just mean in the world of Hearthstone? No, just... she's at like rank five. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I know you were stuck at rank six. What happened? I was did you, did you power uh, through. I... No, I actually went on a 10-game losing streak, uh, flipped the table, what? wrecked my computer, and uh, yeah, there's no more Hearthstone for me. <laughs> that was all a joke, guys. I didn't actually wreck oh, my good. computer, obviously, because, you know, you can see me right now. But uh, no, I yeah, I was like one win away, like on my promotion match to get to rank five, probably six times, and then I lost like three or four in a row, and then I'd work my way back up, and I'd be like, oh, promotion match, and I'd get so excited. And so I think it's all in my head. I think I almost like... Over, was overthinking things and was super stressed out because it was like the get to rank five can't lose stars anymore match. Mm. So I think I did it to myself. But then um, I. It's funny was... that you're even calling it promotion match. I've never thought well... of like the rank six five stars game as promotion. Well, that's kind of what but it now, is, right? Oh yeah, with the rank floors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and and so... and I've seen Jocelyn in Heroes of the Storm a lot, so I can see that terminology seeping into your brain a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Oh my god, dude, I love heroes right now. Don't get me started. But anyways, um, so yeah, I, I kind of got in this weird headspace every time I got into that match. And then um, a few days ago, it was, it was before the weekend, because I didn't play any on the weekend, because I just had so many things I was angry and stressed about that I just PvP'd all weekend in WoW. But um, so right before the weekend, it was, I guess, Friday morning, I tried uh, just, you know, doing my you know, 15 or 20 games a day. And I was like, okay, today's the day. I'm going to get to rank five. And then I lost 10 games in a row to just super annoying crap to my opponents getting perfect draws. And I think by the last game, like I was starting to make stupid mistakes. I was just so frustrated. I was like, I legit hate myself right now. I can't do anything right. I'm not playing Hearthstone anymore, so I stopped. Oh. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to it, but um, yeah, I needed a break because <laughs> I was just so freaking frustrated. It happens. Yeah. That's so rough. So, I, I have to, I, 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 um, Thanks are in order, though, for you, Joss. I, I come bearing uh, deep gratitude on this episode. Why? Um, so, <laughs> like sarcasm? <laughs> no, not at all. 100% sincere. Um, as you both know, I don't stream very often. Like my own games. I stream podcasts multiple times a yeah. week, but I don't stream my own games almost ever. Uh, and I decided to try streaming my solo show, The Angry Nerd, on Friday. I figured, all right, okay, this is fun. There's some people here we're chatting. Let's play some Hearthstone. Let's get some. Let's get some dailies done. And uh, I had a daily to play a bunch of secrets. So guess <laughs> what deck I played? Secret Mage. <laughs> yeah, and guess guess what happened? I. Uh, I went undefeated for like seven games in a row. I just was poning fools on ladder <laughs> with your secret mage, Joss. It's super fun. I haven't touched that deck uh, since I think two days after our Angora launch episode where you talked about it. And for whatever reason, just never deleted it. And it was still there. 
Uh, and I'm like, oh, chat room, okay, well, let's just take uh, let's take this this dusty old old Jocelyn secret mage out for a spin. I was just destroying people. I was like, you could feel their soul break. Yeah. As as all of these secrets just kept destroying them, it was um, it was a lot of fun. I had a good time. Yeah, it's it is a really fun deck, and I think there's um, a much more refined, but maybe a little bit less fun version now. That's pretty much climbing up to the top of like tempo storms, meta snapshots, and stuff. So there are other versions you can play with it now. But I like the original one. It's just super fun, and it, it has like elements of like casino mage with like babbling books and Kabbalist tomes, and just give me all the random crap. It's just it's just a super fun deck it's not meant to be super competitive but i am surprised because people are still messaging me and saying things like you did like man this deck is really fun and i'm actually winning <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm the, not uh, the version that's like listed on tempo storm is not that much different than yours and it's actually mm. considered a tier one deck right now um <laughs> standard i win mage. i can i think I... the biggest thing is uh they put the, like, I didn't have the Medes valets in there, and I think. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, I yeah. Put, yeah I put those in there after you because I was like, no way, that's not. There's no way that's not in there. Um, yeah, but I, and, like I didn't have primordial glyphs in my version. I didn't have. I, I had like less casinoy stuff, mm -hmm. and just all in on like the secret thing. But uh, their version, actually, I'm looking at it right now. They got like Yog in this deck. <laughs> so, well, yeah, the, yeah, Yog is making his way in, but. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I still don't embrace the Yog. <laughs> yeah. I, I have one I was playing in Wild, actually, which I think is really good. Um, all I changed was I put two Kirin Tor mages and one Lackey. They had two Lackeys and one Kirin Tor. But I was like, the Lackey is fine, but he's, like, early on, I don't want to, like, turn one Lackey counter spell, right, mm -hmm. and then counter their coin. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not really what I want. So I was like, Kirin Tor mages is so good. And then when Duplicate, oh, my God. <laughs> so you get tier, Kirin Tor Mage duplicate, then you get two Kirin Tor Mages, and then you have all your secrets. It's so good. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like, I, I can't believe all it took was Arcanologist to make mm -hmm. Secret Mage like a legit deck. <laughs> well, because, I mean, it used to be, well, I guess not technically Secret Mage, but just kind of Mage in general, particularly Freeze Mage, did so well with Undertaker because it would pull a secret from your deck and play it. And, it or not Undertaker, sorry. Mad Scientist. Mad Scientist, thank you. I was like, Death Rattle, clearly it's Undertaker. Uh, <laughs> Mad Scientist. Uh, because it would pull and actually play, and Mad Scientist was way overpowered. So Arcanologist does a, has a very similar effect in that it gets that thing that you need out of your deck without you actually having to draw it, and that's the super powerful effect. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of not surprised that Archaeologist ended up making decks like this really work because it's just, it's so, so powerful. Anytime you can go into your deck and pull a specific card or card type out, same reason why Curator is really powerful, because you can build around that pulling out of beasts and murlocs and dragons. So just that effect of pulling from your deck without having to wait to draw it, it's just so good. It's, it's better than normal card draw. Yeah. True. Yep. Completely agree. I've uh, been having a lot of fun with the deck. I think I might just keep playing the dang thing. I did it to get a daily done, and Mage has never been my go to class, but th that's, yeah. this is what I've been enjoying about Angoro. I'm playing Druid. I'm playing uh, Mage. I'm still playing Rogue. Those are those are my three bottom classes. That's where when I do stream games, people look at my wins and they judge the hell out of me. So <laughs> I, uh, uh, man, this, this freaking expansion just keeps giving in terms of mm. my yeah, enjoyment. Yeah, this is usually the, the part of the expansion where we're all waiting for the next one already. Yeah. And uh, I'm not I don't ready hear for it. anybody talking fun. about the next one at all. Like yeah. we're all still having a blast, and we're you know two almost two months in. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's crazy. I can't believe it's been yeah. that long already. Yeah, which by and, the way, I've been I've been playing nothing but wild this whole month. Essentially, I'm at like rank five now. I think in wild, um, and yeah, rank five in wild. And I'm playing a bunch of decks in there. Like it, that that meta is all over the place and super fun. And even when it's like started to kind of settle in a little bit at rank five, it's still all over, like I I we were talking about it last week. <laughs> Oh, maybe it's just rank fifteen. Everyone's doing all this crazy stuff. No, no, they're doing all, all the, the crazy up. stuff at rank five too. It is nuts. And uh, there's actually I now... actually have a deck that I need to send you. Okay. Somebody sent it to me and was like, 
this deck is wild is awesome and wild and you know like big streaks into legend and all that kind of stuff i can't remember um i think there's one priest deck and one paladin deck and i can't remember which was which but i remind me at the end of the show i have a deck right. to send you down. for your, down for your wild out. climb <laughs> but last night on wild i was playing old school control warrior Ooh. yeah <laughs> and it was so fun. Double Elise, old school control warrior. Like, there's just so many things you can do right now. Uh, the game is just in a, it's in a fantastic spot. And, like, no matter where I play, I'm just having a blast. Like, arena, a blast. Wild, a blast. Standard, a blast. It's like, okay. Okay, Hearthstone. <laughs> you finally did it. And yet, read it. No, never mind. <laughs> I I I, uh, I actually am uh, on board with some of the naysaying on Reddit this week. Uh, <laughs> more on that later in the Ooh, show. Oh, Garrett agrees with Reddit. Oh, <laughs> it's not. I don't. When we get to the to the news, I don't think it's a strong stance. I don't think it's a it's brave sure. of me to agree with some of the outrage off Reddit right now. Uh, but before we do that, um, let's thank a sponsor. Uh, our sponsor this week is Dot Game Domain Names. We have mentioned them before, but we're going to mention them again in case. This is where you're just now tuning in, but also because they support us, and that's really cool. Uh, dot game domains are available pretty much anywhere. You can go and get yourself a domain name. You can pick one up at Hover, Unit Registry, or you can go right to the source at Get Dot Game. Uh, relatively new domain name. Many of the best names are still available. Don't need to like put a bunch of like extra X's uh, and your favorite anime character's <laughs> name in the uh, in your domain name. It's wonderful. Because normally that's what people do. Put three X's in their domain name, and that never gets confusing. <laughs> right. It's, it, come on. You've you played World of Warcraft. There's like, how many Gogeta Roth XXX's are out there? Come on. It's, you don't need to do that. Uh, dot game domains, there's still plenty of, that, plenty of domains available with the correct spellings. And they're going to be at E3, which is coming up, and I'm getting really excited for it, even though... Uh, my list of games I really need to finish is getting taller and taller because we're, we're apparently never going to get a dry spell of games to play this year. Uh, but I'm still excited no. for E3. And if you're going to E3, go say hi to the Dot Game crew. Mention a move; They'll give you some swag. And they're also going to have some special discounts there on the show floor. So go and seek them out. Also, damn it, I want to go to E3. I'm jealous of you, nameless listener I'm talking to directly. <laughs> So we uh, we thank Dot Game Domains for sponsoring this episode of the Angry Chicken. Go to get Dot Game. Just, just real quick, what do you think? Boom Dot Game. You think that's available? Ooh. Uh, I, I I I don't know. I don't. It I... is available. <laughs> All right. Boom Dot Game. Shazam Dot Game. You think that's available? Maybe. Shazam it is, is available. Wow. I'm actually patches like Dot Game. Company. Do you think that might be available? Patches. Let's check it out. It is available. Oh my god! So <laughs> many available names that you can choose from. Uh, Crazy. That's fantastic. Yog dot game, totally available. Wow. What do you know? <laughs> Which to, to serious it up real quick. If you are a listener of the Angry Chicken and you're developing a game and you are using a dot game domain, write in and let us know. We'll be more than happy to use you as a use case scenario. So uh, <laughs> let us know and uh, we'll we'll give you some props right here on Tack. But uh, until then, we've got some Hearthstone news. Debated dot game, sure. Oh, oh yeah, is it? <laughs> <laughs> totally available. <laughs> I love this Dills. Uh, Dills, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, fine listeners, because I know this sounds so rehearsed, Dills doesn't warn us about these bits no. that he does. No, no. It, he just shows up and he's just like, I got something to say. And we're like, oh, man, this is going to be good. Yeah, this is either going to be really good or really terrible. Yep. And it's amazing. All, All right, cool. never terrible. <laughs> no, they're never terrible. I don't know. Some of those spoilers for whatever the old sponsor was that we shall not name. <laughs> some of the those movies. Sponsor? Yeah, the the... Like oh, those were classic bits. What are you talking do? about, Jocelyn? <laughs> Some of them were super Screw spoiler. You, we're not me. friends we anymore. We got in trouble for the. Oh. All right. Let's see. I believe Jocelyn he spoiled. Sucks um... not game. Uh, <laughs> oh. Totally available. Oh man. <laughs> Nobody buy that. That's so mean. <laughs> Somebody buy Dill's Castaway Spoilers dot game, please, because that's I believe that's what Jocelyn is referencing. But uh, oh, anyway, yeah, okay, anyways, yeah, let's. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. If you haven't now seen, <laughs> if you haven't seen Castaway by now, I I, I have no I I have no uh, I'm not saying sorry. And I wasn't even the one spoiling it, but it's it's been out long enough. Get with it. Anyways, we have some Hearthstone news to discuss. Let's do it. Good news, everyone. Oh, no. So we had a free card day over the weekend. We got a free fight promoter just for logging in. 
And while this is not exactly the most game-changing uh, thing in the world for those of us, uh, well, all three of us here with our filled-out collections, uh, I think this is kind of rad. Do um, you guys think we're going to see more of this stuff in the future? Uh, I mean, I would hope so, <laughs> right? Yeah. They seem to kind of be gauging the reaction of the community based on the different free things that they're doing. So um, we'll probably see more free things. I don't know if they'll redo free card day, but... Yeah, I liked... Um, uh, probably my favorite thing that came out of this was, was Ben Brown clarifying because there were a bunch of people on Reddit like, oh, they're totally testing something. And he got in and he's just... And I quote, Ben Brown wrote, do we need to test if people like free stuff? My guess is no. I'm fairly certain they do. And I love that because... Yeah, everyone calm down. I don't think I don't think this was like some big test and like, all right, oh, okay, we gave them a free epic. They seem to like this. <laughs> well, I think it's more along the lines of, or at least uh, conspiracy theory hat Joss is thinking that it's maybe a little bit more along the lines of like, how much free stuff can we give away while satisfying the community without doing like daily rewards and stuff? Right. Because obviously people love daily rewards, but I'm sure that they're probably pushing the envelope to try to figure out like where exactly that happy community line exists. Sure. And also yeah. maybe looking at sales that day. Did sales yeah. go up? Did sales go down? We got a lot of people to log in, right? More mm -hmm. people log in to get that free card and then buy some packs. And I think uh, I think Ben Brode's response is funny and cheeky, yes. but uh, no, it's yeah. I, I, there's, there's always a reason to be giving away. Yeah, things. there's there's data happening in the background yes. of this giveaway. Data sure. is happening. I'm data a is happening. Well, <laughs> and, data is happening. Uh, and he's gonna have a picture Bro, of data Bro, from Star Trek. Sorry. Bro did also interject again. Um, <laughs> He uh, he said that, uh, you know, putting aside the question of how much is the right amount of free stuff, he said that their question was, what is the right way to deliver the free stuff? Um, talking about, you know, what is better, ranked rewards, better quests, tavern brawl packs, which are all ways that we currently can get free packs. Um, and he, he said that he personally doesn't, he's not too into daily logins. He said that he finds them tedious because uh, he has to remember to log in every day and he, and it's a feel bad situation yeah. when he misses a day. And I, that's interesting. I never really thought of it that way. Um, the there is that because I don't know if you still play uh, Pokemon go. Uh, I don't, nope. I still play it when I walk my dog and they have the new thing where if you have seven days in a row of catching a Pokemon or hitting a Pokestop, you know, you get like you get streak reward, bonuses. Yeah. And if you miss a day, you're like, ah, you get reset it's, all well, there is a feels bad yeah. man component there, but it's, it's same, still better than nothing. I don't know. Yeah. And it's the same sort of logic that Blizzard is kind of applying in the WoW micro holidays where they're saying like, we're not making them super rewarding because they're only a day or two long. And if you miss them, then it feels really bad. It's like, yeah, but if you make the effort. It feels really good, and don't you mm -hmm. want to reward effort and people actually going into your game? Yeah, I, I, I really yeah. disagree. I, I really so disagree with the micro holiday logic because th there's no reason to do it. Like, there's exactly. just no reason at all to do it. And it would be really cool if I went to these old zones where these things were happening and there were actually people there doing it, um, but there's not. Yeah, <laughs> no one goes and does it because there's no reason to go and do it. The only one that I went to do was the Angoro. Um, one because it was i think on st patrick's day it was like or no it was before that because the yeah. angoro like big release was uh march 17th so it was like a few days before that maybe even the weekend before that and all of the like um angoro bosses in world of warcraft ended up being legendary cards and they were all new for this micro holiday so i was like oh i want to go and get like a preview basically and try to figure out what what might happen so uh so yeah it was like that was interesting but I'm a very niche kind of case, right? <laughs> Where yeah. like I want to go in and figure out things ahead of time. Um, but yeah, well, it was I, a I good think excuse. There's something to be said for daily for daily login rewards because you're rewarding players like us that log in every day anyway. Sure. And you might entice more people who log in when they can or every once in a yeah, while you're to get actually get in there in. more. Yeah. And like if it's you know okay, so if you log in five days in a row, it's like increasing amounts of dust, and then every now and then mm. it's gold, and then if you go like a full week, you get a pack. Like. I, to be honest, even if it's not cumulative, even if it's just like the days you log in, you get blah, then sure. people are going to log in more. <laughs> exactly. And and the and his argument I find a little annoying to be honest. Like <laughs> his argument that if you miss a day it's sad because I did miss a day in Pokémon and I was like, "Oh, it was sad, but I was like, oh, I had a really good day. I never thought about Pokémon that day cuz I was doing a lot of stuff." 
<laughs> I wasn't ultimately actually sad that I missed the day. And for that to mean like it takes like it's like, oh, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't give, you know, uh, food away to the homeless uh, because if one homeless one guy doesn't come, yeah. he's sad. It's like, <laughs> no, no, you don't do like something just because it's sad if you like the, all the other people are happy when they're logging in. Right. Like you, you do it because of all the, uh, of the other people who aren't missing it. And it's, it's kind of like RNG creates great stories. Well, one person had a great story, and the other person was like, this sucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> so there's always going to be a, a sad to a happy story in that fashion. But he's like, fine with that. So I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. It doesn't really hold water. I'm, I'm not sure that's the most perfect analogy in the world. Um, <laughs> no, probably but, not. But I'm just saying. Like, but uh, I mean, Jones my... is known for his more extreme. <laughs> Do it. I'm just it? saying. Meat cereal. Can we all just take a minute and remember meat cereal? <laughs> Again, meat cereal though was funny and, and cheeky. Whereas I, I would like to point out that I do not necessarily think that missing a free digital item is on the same level as it's human feeding. hunger. It's not on the same <laughs> level, but I mean, I'm like I'm saying that's the same type of like argument. That's the same type of like, okay, let's not give, let's not buy our kid a toy today because if I don't buy my kid a toy tomorrow, he'll be sad. Okay, there. I, is that more, better? Here, here's there, here's yeah. my logic. If you're I'll not the homeless out of my argument. <laughs> the, the, the here's my logic. The because the 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 other side of the coin is don't give a, a login reward. If they're not giving out login rewards, it's the same end result as someone not logging in and missing the reward. They're not getting anything I, a, anyway. So yeah, why? So everyone's sad every yeah. day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're all sad. Every day I log in and there's no reward, I'm sad. Yeah. <laughs> so make me yeah. happy, bro. Yeah. Let's go. At the end of the day, I don't think any of this is a particularly big deal. It's free stuff. It's cool if we get it. If I miss it, I don't care. I can't tell you the last time I actually logged in and did a tavern brawl because I don't care about the tavern brawl. I don't care. Oh, I always do the tavern brawl. I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I, I want that classic need... pack, whether it gives me 40 dust or not, which it generally <laughs> does. But I just, I just like, even don't the, do the it. last one too. I don't know if you played it, but it was the uh, it was the return of what Kelthazad versus yeah. what's who was it? Arc Thief or Fom? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Something and really if thrilling. If you were Kelthazad, you just lost. But I still tried really hard. Every single tried time. really hard to get and the other hero. Lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh really bad yeah but my, my point is i am not i'm not gonna sit here and complain like they should just give me the free pack because i don't like playing brawl it, it's fine i move on with my life i have i have the cards i need i'll be okay i'll be okay you know we shouldn't play games because somebody has to lose if we mm. play games <laughs> you know we shouldn't do anything we shouldn't have conversations because someone <laughs> isn't gonna get a word in you know we, we just shouldn't yeah, we shouldn't eat food because <laughs> someone else isn't eating food and they're sad. <laughs> we shouldn't go to sleep, you know, because someone else is awake and Ooh. he's sad. But but someone <laughs> someone else is probably awake and happy. <laughs> this conversation is going to spiral. It's gone. Moving yeah, I'm way just off. Saying. Moving on. I'm just um, the one thing I would like to interject is I would really like to see this as a fireside promotional tool. I know I've mentioned in the past that uh, pr yeah, promo maybe. cards for attending local tournaments and firesides would be really cool. And while this is not going, these aren't unique cards we're getting. The fight promoter didn't have like a stamp with the date on it or something, which is what like a promo card I would get from going to a local magic tournament. Uh, that's the example I'm giving. This is, I think, a, would be a huge step in that direction. Um, because I, I think they, they you need to incentivize Fireside more. And, and there are some really cool things coming uh, as far as Fireside's uh, and in, in-game in uh, improvements. But uh, why not? Why not take it one step further? Why not, um, you know, for, for give maybe a certain window of months? Like for the next three months, if you attend well, an official for Fireside. The seasons, right? Yeah. We already have the Hearthstone year split into a specific you know, set of seasons. So why not just make it, this is the summer season, make it, put it in the reward set so you can only play it in wild and make it golden. Done. That sounds cool. Yeah, that'd be, uh, I think that'd be really rad. Um, I'd be, I'd be super into that. And, and now that this tech is here, we just log in and get a free card. Why not? Because we know they're adding, um, you know, location tech that's going to, you know, kind of enhance the fireside experience. So I, 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 it seems to me like this would be relatively easy to execute on, and I would be really jazzed as an innkeeper uh, to, to see this come. So anyways, moving on. Moving on I to, bet you never thought you'd say 
that as phrase, an innkeeper. Jazzed yeah. as an innkeeper. I'd be really jazzed as an innkeeper. Yeah. <laughs> Who really jazzed as an innkeeper? That's giggle. I was like, that's a really weird phrase. It is, it is. But it totally makes sense. It's strange. Yeah. Eventually, eventually you'll stop. I don't. It's like anything else. I'm sure people, if if they heard us in our general Hearthstone conversations passing by, would go, "What the hell are they talking yeah, about?" That's true. And in Rage Seven Seven with Wind Fury, what? Four man of seven seven, and then you all laughed. It was weird. <laughs> They're kids these days with their drugs. <laughs> oh. Anyways, uh, moving on to less fun things. Um, hey, we got some clarifications about that wild tournament, guys. T- today. You know the 23rd when there's about a week left in the season? and Yep. Um, here's what you've been playing for. <laughs> here's what you've been playing for. And yeah, uh, many, uh, especially New Zealand and Australian players, are not too pleased because in the clarification was uh, that m- basically, hey, you guys have been playing on the wrong server. You don't qualify even if you made it into, yeah, the, what? into the top. Yeah, this is... I don't understand how this happened. Be- this is such a... This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I know I said that last week about the Buffalo Wild Wings thing, but two weeks in a row where I'm just like, who is making decisions over there? Yeah. I don't. The thing that I really don't understand is why they made May the qualification month. Like, why did they even mention that they were going to do a tournament without giving everyone all of the rules? Like, what they should have done is said in June, like, we're going to. We're announcing this thing, so use May as a practice month. And then in June, you're going to, you know, talk, top 64, there's going to be a wild tournament. We'll give you all of the rules, all of the everything through the month of May. And then starting June 1st, you know, get in there and rank up. Like, they went into this really half-cocked, and so many people are screwed over because of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, there, really there was... Really yeah. There was, I, I, I don't, don't get it. I don't see a universe where... A, a section of the player base were not going to come out of this angry because even, even if this particular, if this particular issue didn't come out, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm sure someone would have been like, Oh, well that's a low price pool or we're not getting HCT points or whatever. Cause we didn't know anything about it other yeah. than the amount of no, players and that it was going to be wild. But you're saying like, that's what you're, you're saying. We didn't know anything about it, but they, they gave us enough information to get everybody all a tizzy, Hot and bothered, right? yeah. Yeah, they were like, hey, <laughs> top 64. <laughs> oh my all God, Jocelyn. All that community so hot and bothered, all in a tizzy. Uh, so, no, but they like gave us, okay, top 64 in wild. Tournament, go. Yeah. Why give us even that information if you're not, just give us all of it the moment you announce it, right? Like, yeah. doesn't that just make sense? Like, if we announce the taco, we were like, okay, there's going to be, uh, by the way, I, that's another phrase that w- doesn't make sense if you don't follow the show. If we announced a taco, uh, <laughs> so if we, if we announced one of our open Hearthstone tournaments and we didn't give any information about like what day it was or what the prize was going to be or what the format was going to be, people would be pissed at us, right? I mean, we would never think to even do that. I and would, it's a I... low, F, like it's, there's no stakes really. This is a twenty-five thousand dollar tournament, and they just didn't announce the rules when they announced the tournament. That doesn't make sense at all. No. What it, meetings it, were they in where someone was like, "Yeah, let's just make a cryptic tweet. That'll be how we announce it, and then we won't say anything else for twenty-five days." Yeah, this is the kind of thing you you would expect from a, you know a homebrewed gra- grassroots tournament that's just getting started up, right? You would expect them to be like, "We're doing a tournament uh, sometime. We don't know, but you can qualify this way." You yeah. do Calm not. There, Marty. You do, oh, jeez, Rick. Oh, man, Rick. I don't know what to do with the wild tournament, Rick. Uh, <clears throat> I really shouldn't be doing this in my throat. Yeah. Um, no, you shouldn't. The, More the, bourbon. My point is, my point is, is that uh, you don't expect that from a multi-billion-dollar company no. that has an esports division. That I applied for and didn't get the job at. I applied for three, <laughs> interviewed for three, and didn't get hired for those three jobs. <laughs> yeah, I'm man. not bitter so at all. The guy who thought this was a good idea? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. So, it, and it, like the other thing that makes this kind of really unfortunate and weird is that, as chat room is currently pointing out, that Australia and New Zealand are automatically placed in North America for 
every other thing. And then yep. randomly yeah. for this wild tournament, they're like, oh no, you you have to rank up in Asia, guys. Like, well, but isn't we, that wild though, Jocelyn? Isn't oh, that just it wild? is wild. <laughs> that maybe that's it. They just want to make this tournament as wild as possible, so sure. they're just mixing everything up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's just bizarre. I don't understand. Yeah. I, By the I, way, it was, uh, Callum, our, our buddy Callum Leslie, who wrote the uh, article on Dot Esports about it, and he he brought up all these points in there too. It's just like it's so obvious. Anybody who's talking about it is talking about this exact thing, and I don't see how this was missed. Like you would, mm-hmm. I just I don't know. Like I, this one floored me. By the way, like they've done many things where I'm like, okay, let me make the argument that this is why, right? This one, I'm just like, no, I can't find the argument why. This was the way they did it. I don't there, get there, it. there just isn't one. It's it's just completely bonkers. I'm at a loss for words because I, I don't want to name call or anything, but this is the dumbest thing I think I've ever seen come out of Blizzard in terms of uh, their their esports initiative. I don't yeah. how you've done how many tournaments now and yet and they're doing great things too. By the way, yeah, like the last uh, playoffs that we just watched. Fantastic broadcast. They figured out how to how to broadcast a Swiss tournament mm-hmm. in a fan, really great way, N- like never skipping a beat. They're doing fantastic stuff in other places. How are they? I don't yeah, it boggles <laughs> yeah. the mind. I don't so know. yeah, and I think that there were also a lot of players, like pro players included, who were ranking up on all different servers to try to like increase their number of entries or like all kinds of stuff. Like they were playing on like EU and NA both and like it's just so much wasted time for so many people. And the people that they're screwing over are some of the most I guess, visible Hearthstone players. Like, these are the players that people, like, they know their names. They watch their streams. They see them playing for HCT points all over the place. Like, if you want your game to have, like, good word of mouth and good press, like, (laughs) you don't really want to screw over these people. I can see a lot of people being really upset, and it's just so easily avoided it's just yeah. blowing my mind like yeah. it's hours know. though like they yeah. they it's not you know a few it's not i spent a few hours laddering up mm-hmm. in wild that i wouldn't have done no that's you know it's 50 plus whatever hours yeah to do it even it's if you have a lot a really of games. win rate and then suddenly you're like oh no not on that server okay yeah that doesn't count all right <laughs> Yeah, so I I don't know. In, in, like my final thoughts are that we're literally talking about this the day we found out about it. Um, so we we really things could change. They could make good. I have a lot of faith in Blizzard and the specifically the esports division, which by the way is is separate from Team Five. Like mm-hmm. it, it is. This is not Team Five. I do. It is not Team Five that made this decision. I'm sure it was the esports division. Sure, but um, I. I, be- I believe they'll make it right, and I hope they make it right. I hope so. Because the the players deserve better. Because This is not an easy thing to do. It is not easy to get that high of a rank uh, on the wild ladder, on any ladder for that matter. So um, it, it shouldn't even matter what ladder you're on, man. Why does it suddenly matter? It's so bizarre. I don't know. I, 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 think, I think, yeah, we're being harsh right now because I think that's the correct reaction. But... <laughs> If they go and make it right and figure something out, then I will be equally uh, you know, Happy. responsive to that. Yeah. Like, I, I will give them credit if they do that. So hopefully that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I uh, feel like they did something. Sorry, Garrett. I feel like they did something similar to this before where they had something along the lines of, like, in order to qualify, you had to live in the region where you played. Is that how the new HCT system works? I feel like this is kind of like precedented for Blizzard and it might not even be Hearthstone that I'm thinking about. It might be like a WoW rule or something. For, I can't uh, say for sure, but I know in the but past, I, like, like it your sounds players so have familiar. Played. Yeah, maybe. Where like players have to play in their home region to qualify. Um, I know they've tried. So, I, mean, I want to say they've tried so both. So that still doesn't exclude the whole Australia New Zealand problem because their sure. home region isn't or hasn't been in the past, hasn't been Asia in the past. So that kind of throws a wrench into it, but 
maybe it was with the Japanese localization or so. I can't remember, but I feel like this has happened before. I mean, and it, so it's even weirder that it's happening again. Throughout the whole course of, I think, Blizzard Esports history, they've they've tried both. I know they've tried mm -hmm. both. And, and it was funny because back when StarCraft II was getting its esports legs and they instituted a rule like that, uh, American teams were just signing South Korean players and they would move to America and they were an American player. But it was funny because you were rooting for <laughs> for J Dong, you're rooting for J Dong as a as an American player, and he's from South Korea. He just happened to be on the Evil Geniuses at the time. Yeah. So, whatever the case, um, yeah, this is just so freaking bizarre. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, here's an idea: don't announce your tournament until you actually know what's going on and can tell your your competitors what the rules are. Please, mm -hmm. thank you. And before we move on to strategy and uh, talk about the fun of playing the game of Hearthstone as opposed to really weird esports things. Let's thank our patrons over at patreon.com slash TAC for supporting our show and our confusion through weird <laughs> esports things. Um, we really appreciate it, guys. Uh, as, as many of you know, the three of us do this for a living, and the Patreon is a big chunk of our paycheck and also allows us to buy cards. And it's the reason I'm not sitting here like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't have that many young cards. So thank you very much guys. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, if you enjoy attack and you want to support us, check out patreon.com slash TAC. And on this specific episode, let's thank Matthew C, Ryan R, Andres H, Tim L and Ben C. Everyone gave a last name this week. Yay. <laughs> So, thank you everyone for the support. And now, let's move on and talk about Token Shaman. Hit it very hard. You wanna blow something up? Ha <laughs> <laughs> oh, ha! <laughs> Time to pay! So, if Druid isn't your thing, and last week you were listening to us talk about uh, Agro Druid, and you're thinking, this sounds cool, but I just hate Malfurion because he annoyed me in that one zone in Legion. Well, we've got another deck with a bunch of little dudes for cheap that you can flood the board with and win it's called token shaman and it's uh, it's been making quite a few waves in the last week bills take us in well this version too is not only token it's evolve devolve shaman. evolve devolve yeah it's yeah. awesome <laughs> so you don't have to do the evolve devolve thing to also make this deck work there's and actually just recently i think it was the uh, the playoffs, the European playoffs, RDU actually, who qualified and is going to go to Shanghai, was playing a token shaman. I don't think it was running the Evolve stuff, but it was the double bloodlust, flood the board with little guys, and, uh, and you know, win the game. And it's funny because shaman in this, in this uh, expansion has been kind of having a problem finding its footing, right? Uh, for a long time, people were just saying, oh, we lost... Tunnel Trog and Totem Golem, I guess we're done, you know. Turns out that you can still run the little Jade Package and Bloodlust and a few other cards that are pretty good, and you're still a very strong deck. So that's kind of the point of this deck is to get on the board early and make a couple of value trades, and then at some point when you have a bunch of little guys and they have run out of AoE or something like that, you Bloodlust and you win. And that's basically the idea here. But then it also runs the... In like this version, and I actually played this quite a bit. It's actually really good. It runs the insane combination of Doppelgangster Evolve, which mm -hmm. if they wipe your board on say turn five, on turn six, Doppelgangster and Evolve is three six drops, three random six drops, but three six but drops. But three six drops, yeah. Yeah, and that you know, like there's some really good, like Aya is a six drop. Like you end up with that quite often, and it's really really strong. So. It's kind of funny how like something that was thought of as Mimi is now all of a sudden in the meta and actually on the the Tempo Storm snapshot as a legitimate deck. And it's just kind of it's kind of weird. It's like people it's I think it's considered tier two on their snapshot. Let me let me check. I think quick. so, yeah. Yeah. Top of tier two is this exact deck. And that this was always a super Mimi thing, so I'm very happy to see it here because I actually I was playing mid range shaman in Mean Streets and I just threw in one doppelgangster and one evolve because I was like if I ever get that combo off, it just wins you games right. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the deck was just pure mid range shaman, uh, so it's kind of fun to see that being a thing. The other cards that kind of make this go uh, is Firefly because Firefly you know immediately gets you two bodies and. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, Flame Tongue Totem. But the other cool card that's here, Primal Fin Totem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a, in a not so Murloc shaman, in a not Murloc shaman, I love yeah. it because it's two bodies on board. It's yeah. Two bodies. Yeah. Granted, the turn after you play it and it bloodlust, you need to wait until so many sickness is over. But it's still a really great card in this uh, in this deck. And there's what I like is there's so many ways to get back on board after after any type of board clear. If you mm-hmm. if you play smart, if you don't just play if, you know play your dude play your creating <laughs> exactly don't just throw down the primal fin totem blindly don't just throw down your doppelganger blindly because these are the type of cards that if you are fairly certain an aoe is about to hit the board you can hold on to and then next turn you can refill your board well the the primal fin totem too it's only two mana for the zero three and the one one and oftentimes what it'll do is it's a it's a zero three totem that has to be dealt with right so if you drop this on turn two they will go out of their way to kill it. And then on turn three, you drop like a mana tide. And they're like, oh, I just did all the stuff to kill that zero three. Now you drop a mana tide. This is drawing you a card every turn. And, you know, they just can't quite deal with it. So it's it's one of those cards that it just re- requires a response or else it gets out of hand. And it also kind of allows you to do early filling of the board without over committing, right? It's one card that just kind of starts you know, generating tokens every turn. And, and of course, also the, just the ability to hit that hero power uh, as a shaman every turn is actually really strong, and it runs double thing from below as well. So a lot of times in the early turns, you're trying to fit in, you know, button pressing, and then next thing you know, you're getting free uh, six drops that evolve into seven drops. So mm-hmm. very, very cool stuff here. And then uh, the double devolve might look a little weird in this deck, but <clears throat> what devolve does is let's say you're playing against a deck and they drop two taunt minions. Well, Hex used to not get through those taunt minions, but Devolve plus a Bloodlust oftentimes will just win you the game. You Devolve their taunts and then you Bloodlust and you go straight through. Yeah. So. Well, it's, Devolve is not even that powerful just because of taunt minions. That kind of used to be the case. But right now on Ladder, you've got you know Pirate Warriors, you've got Murloc Paladins, you've got uh, Beast Druids, Mm-hmm. And hunters, yeah, you take away their synergy. They're, yeah, yeah, they're all very, very powerful, and you see a lot of that on ladder right now. So the ability to actually get rid of all those synergies from all of those different classes that you're going to be facing is super, super powerful. Mm-hmm. I've been totally wiped by this deck because I'm I was playing my paladin deck, and I'm like, yay, look at all my murlocs, and then they're like, no more murlocs, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> or how about when you play the uh, you play against that aggro druid, and you're like, hey, I'm a I'm a flood paladin, they're like living mana, and you're like, devolve. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Pretty nice. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've been really enjoying this. I was, uh, you, you sent it over and this was in a deck I was, I was familiar with at all. And then I just looked at it and I'm like, blood sail Corsair evolve making right now. Cause I get very <laughs> mm-hmm. excited anytime evolve is involved. Yeah. I didn't even mean to do that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, this, this is a fun deck. I like, I, I've always been a fan of just minion based decks. Um, and I'm glad that Ungoro has kind of bring, brought them back. Uh, mm-hmm. even if one of those is, like I think Zoo is one of the only good ways to play Warlock right now, and that's kind of funny. But I'm totally fine with it because I like playing the deck. It's it's kind of interesting that what Ngoro has done is take these ideas that people were doing before that were always like meme decks, right? So they were like, "Oh, I'm gonna play Secrets Mage. Here I go, <laughs> all the secrets." And they're like, "It doesn't work. It just doesn't work." And now suddenly with Ngoro, you can really go down an idea. Like, you can go down the path of one idea, and it actually works as a deck. And maybe it's because of the rotation of some of the cards from some of those older sets. Maybe it was the Black Rock Mountain cards and the TGT cards that were holding all this stuff back because there was powerful kind of uh, neutral stuff that you were forgoing when you went down, uh, you know, one path towards one idea. Maybe that was the issue that was holding it back, and now that we don't have that, uh, it's suddenly working, but maybe it's just the fact that a couple of these Ungoro cards really just filled out the ish. Like they just they finalized that thing. It was like that one little patch that it was missing. Right now, suddenly the, the deck is complete. Maybe it's that because I think in Wild these decks kind of also work too. So it's just really fun to see, you know, the the ability to come up with an idea and then find a competitive deck with it and mm-hmm. evolve, devolve. I tried right when the those cards were available and there's both of them. I was like, oh my god, I gotta make Evolve Evolve. And the deck was awful. It just didn't work. 
And here we are, you know, in 2017, and it works now. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So get out there and try it. It's, it's really fun. There are definitely counter strategies to it, of course. Wipe the board as much as you can against this deck. Keep it clear because Bloodlust is, is coming. And also, when you have double Bloodlust in a deck, it will be a dead card sometimes. Uh, having both Bloodlust in your hand feels really bad. So uh, it's not an unfair deck at all. Bloodlust is a really good card, obviously, but it's, uh, it's just it's really cool. It's good to see it in, in competitive tournaments as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely yeah, I recommend anyone uh, remotely interested go and try this. Uh, try this deck. It is uh, it is one hundred percent scratching an itch. I didn't realize I had. <laughs> I've been. Uh, it is well, it, yeah, and it's kind of mid range in terms of price, right? So it's about five thousand dust to craft everything, but the there's really only expensive two legendaries. Things, yeah, are, and Aya. which are things that you probably have already crafted because they're not from Angora. They're good. Yeah, yeah, and they're good in multiple types of decks. And then, so we basically got Stonehill Defender, which is common, right? Um, mm -hmm. Firefly, which is another common. And what's the third one? Devolve from... and oh, Primal Evolve Fin are might rares. be rare. Yeah, Devolve and Evolve are both rares. Yeah, and by the but way, even then, that's kind of what the can, deck hinges on. Craft Golden Evolve. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I managed to open two golden evolves just naturally over the course of playing Hearthstone, and uh, I, I I jump at the chance to use it because it's so cool. I also want golden devolve just so when I do both that just both our boards are super sparkly Everything's and animated. Just, yeah, mm. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, I, I don't want golden devolve. I don't want to turn your cards into golden. No, you you should be a, a re regular pleb. I will be the golden guy. <laughs> yeah. but, and also, don't get angry if you draw patches. I, I, I've just held on to him, and late in the game, it's just like, oh, if I play him plus the Bloodlust, that puts me over the top for lethal. Huzzah. Actually, yeah, patches is not the worst to draw in this particular deck. Uh, it, it definitely is better not to, obviously, but obviously. you can use him with Flame Tongue, and you can use him with Bloodlust, and he's good in both instances. So. Yep. Well, I think that's because nine times out of ten, you're not necessarily going to want to play Bloodsail Corsair. It's the only pirate you're going to, like, you're not going to want to play that turn one. You're not going for a super aggressive style, right? You're trying to make the most out of your board. So the thing that you're going to want to do is wait until they have a weapon out so that you can actually get a little bit of value off the Corsair. And then if Patches comes out too, even more of a bonus. Maybe you've got Flame Tongue for a punish or, like Garrett said, you can Bloodlust or whatever, but it's almost like Patches being the Charger late game is actually kind of better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it 100% works in this. Um, and uh, like all minion decks, if it's not an archetype you've been playing recently, placement is very important here. Uh, always be thinking about where you're putting your Flame Tongue Totem uh, and also where you're dropping your Blood Cell Corsair, especially if there's already a Flame Tongue Totem in play, because you, if, if there's nothing to the right of it and you put your Corsair on the left, your patches will pop out on the right and get the buff off of the Flame Tongue. Yeah, patches always comes out on the far right, so you can doesn't matter where you put the the corsair down, patches will come out on the far right. But you're you're absolutely right to bring up the the positioning here because there's another thing too, like totems always pop out on the far right. Yeah, everything and, summoned comes yeah. that way, right? Except for the well, the primal fin always pops out the one one on the right of wherever the totem is, wherever right? It so is, yeah. Wherever Correct. it is, yeah. Yeah. So the, the I think the rule of thumb here, if there is one, is put your low health minions in the middle and high health minions on the outer edges is kind of like the way you can always kind of think of it. Uh, and then you can put like flame tongue in the middle and make trades and they kind of, you get the train going, right? Yep. 100%. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like that a lot. I, I love the board development game. And again, we kind of find ourselves here in Angoro and it, it was, it was gone for a little while until this expansion. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad it's back. I enjoy I don't know. Maybe it's like the base building StarCraft player in me, but I like placing all my pieces and, and thinking about the board state and not just trying to uh, drop a bunch of stuff in one turn and hope they stick. So I, uh, I like. And the you don't have like in. one big drop where you're like, bam, Tyrion. Right. <laughs> right. Right. The big. I mean, you. You honestly, in the sec, you do. You have three of them. You have two thing from Belows and Aya, and those are very formidable minions. But it, not yeah, not to the but, point of Tyrion. But they set up like for the next turn rather than. You know, just I guess Doppelgangster Evolve is you're like, bam, Doppelgangster yeah. Evolve, what up now? Yeah, that's uh, uh, which is so satisfying, by the way. It's, it's like the best thing ever. Yeah, that's that's really uh, that's showing your hand 100%. <laughs> but uh, it's it feels so good when you do it. 
Also, by the way, I found out that some, for some reason, I didn't have Doppelgangster. I don't know how. I never cracked two of these. But <laughs> I had to go craft myself two Doppelgangsters. I didn't even realize it was missing from my collection. But I'm glad I did, because Doppelgangster Evolve is... It's a uh, it's a very fun experience for you, Super not fun. for your opponent. <laughs> not for your no, opponent. yeah, it and sucks for your opponent. Doppelgangster is one of the epics, right? Um, no, it's only a rare. Oh, it's a rare. It's only Jeez, rare. Yeah, only going to cost you. You didn't crap two. Crap two. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> if you are like me, you're there only going to. There are gonna... a lot of rares in the deck actually. Now that I look at it. But oh, there's a ton of rares, but that's there's. Fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Those are only a hundred dust. Yeah, it's, it's not too it's not too bad, and I I think you'd be fine without Aya. Um, I'm not sure you'd be fine without Patches because he has gotten me lethal in multiple games. Uh, I would definitely recommend. Also, if you don't if you don't have Patches yet, craft Patches, man. He's in so <laughs> yeah, many I mean, decks. Patches and Aya are both gonna be around for a while. Yeah. I, I think it's worth. Hey, hey, do you guys well, remember when? You like playing? Sorry, Garrett. Do you guys remember when everyone wanted refunds for Patches when when Small Time Buccaneer got a refund? How funny oh, is yeah, that? They were like, hey, my Patches sucks now, right? Nope. <laughs> nope. Doesn't suck. Try again. Um, yeah, but the thing about Aya is she's kind of part of the whole Jade package in Shaman, right? So you've got Claws, yeah. Lightning, and Aya. And that kind of, if you're doing anything that's even remotely mid mid rangey or controlly or late game, like just that package of five cards is super super powerful so you're gonna you're not trying to this. get into five fives or anything you're just trying no, to make you're just, little dudes that, yeah it's just more guys yeah, yeah. everything so, you do uh, like you're removing stuff and making a guy oh wow that's pretty good okay yeah. turns out <laughs> so she's gonna be she's my point is she's super useful in many different ways that whole package is super useful so if you're going to craft a legendary she's she's a good investment yeah absolutely absolutely uh, well, before we move on to crazy game stories, we wanted to give another shout out to Con Before the Storm. Their Kickstarter is in its final week. There are six days left for the Con Before the Storm Kickstarter. This is the community run conference the night before BlizzCon that uh, the three of us have been going to for multiple years in a row now. And because of hitting one of their stretch goals, we're going to be having our A Move meetup at Con Before the Storm in uh, one of the rooms right there in the Hilton in Anaheim. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, but there are still six days left for their campaign. There's still more uh, more stretch goals that they're trying to hit. So if you haven't already, consider supporting a, a, a fantastic fan-run event at kickstarter.conbeforestorm.com. And they're advertising a live instance, which mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of, but apparently <laughs> that's going to happen. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think the uh, well, the cool. ultimate stretch goal, which we're still a little bit far away from, but the ultimate stretch goal is basically to give the uh, Amu Frog Pants kind of crowd our own ballroom, which would be so freaking cool. So if that sounds like something you guys would want to take part in at BlizzCon, maybe go throw them a couple of dollars. I think they need to uh, figure out how to get a pool table in there. Mm, mm. That is the one <laughs> thing that's missing. Well, yeah. well, you know, you get one of those little like tabletop ones with like the pool cues that are like the size of pencils and the teeny tiny little no, ball. No, no, stop. <laughs> is no, that no. not the same? Okay. Mm -mm. No, okay. Both of you, this is how you do it. Hey, cluckers, tech nation, whatever you want to call yourself, listeners of the Angry Chicken, do you live in Southern California? Do you have a pool table? Most mm. importantly, do you or a friend have a truck? <laughs> Let us know. TACpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, let's, uh, let's see what crazy game stories have uh, made it into the inbox this week. Has the whole world gone crazy? You're in trouble now. You got it! <laughs> you can send your crazy game stories to tacpodcast at gmail.com. My throat hurts. Jocelyn, who does it come from this week? This one comes to us from Zaman Babo, says, yo, Cranky Cluck Collective, here's a sad one for you. I'm playing Arena with a hunter against a mage who has a 2-3 Amani Berserker already on board and drops a vicious fledgling. Thinking I'll outsmart the opponent, I drop Stonehill Defender and Misdirection on turn 5 with hopes that he pings the Berserker to enrage it, kills the 1-4 and goes face with the fledgling, only to have Misdirection force his minions to trade and kill each other. That was the plan, and he took the bait. Hook, line, and sinker. But misdirection was not in my favor as the fledging instead doubled back and whacked Jaina in the face. No problem, I think. I'll just have to find another way to deal with it. 
But no, the fledgling reads, whenever this minion this minion attacks a hero, adapt. So when my when it hit my opponent, he adapted, gained Wind Fury, attacked me, and gained stealth until the end of turn. My board is now empty. I talked back kill command one turn too late. It was out of hand from there, and he steamrolled me to the rest of the way to one of the weirdest losses I've ever suffered. Just thought I'd share. Keep up the good work, and hopefully my sad tale gives someone else some joy. I did not know it worked that way. That's really cool. <laughs> well, yeah, because normally you can't attack your own face with your own minion, right? So, <laughs> good to know. That'd be a really funny thing to do if you could, like, a taunt minions up. It's like, I really want to adapt, and you just smack yourself in the face. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know what we call that? We call that asserting your dominance. Mm. <laughs> Attack face to assert dominance. Attack well, I mean, the, face. The card yeah. just says when it attacks a hero. A hero, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but Dills, so, this is yeah. this is Hearthstone where we have to do things to figure it out as opposed to read a sentence True. and actually trust what it says. It's science. <laughs> but in wow. re in reality, I just you, I, thank yeah. you. <laughs> nice, nice work. <laughs> in reality, I just had never thought of that interaction. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. so well, because you can't hit yourself, so... <laughs> well, how often do you see Misdirection played anymore? Well, that's the other thing, too, yeah. And yeah. so that's like, this is an arena game, so... Well, and Hunters are now, of the three secret classes, the only class that doesn't have a way to get a random secret, right? Because we, we are seeing bizarre secrets played in both Mage and Paladin because of cards True. that received yeah. in Goro. Yeah, yeah. But, well, not yeah, you're even... right, yeah, I think Hunter can't find random secrets anymore at all. I I, yeah, I don't think so. No, there's like no, there's no discover a secret for Hunter and and yeah, I'm, and I'm, lock and load rotated out, didn't it? Out of standard. Yes. Oh no, wait, lock and load is play a spell, get get a. It's piece. a random hunter. Oh, yeah. Spell, yeah. Right. A random hunter card. Card, right, which can yeah. be a spell. Okay. But it's not, yeah, but it's not in standard anymore. So. Yeah. Right. So that because that, that was your only. Been the only way. You're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and, and mage, sorry, that mage wasn't even on Goro specific. They've been able to find crazy, weird, random secrets for a long time. But <laughs> whatever the case is, uh, thanks for sharing your story with us, uh, Zim Zimmon Bobo. If that is your Java. real name, uh, <laughs> if that's your real name, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful baby girl or boy. I don't know. What do you What do you want to name it? Oh, I will name her Zimbobo. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to listeners whose names are really Zimbobo. Exactly. <laughs> Garrett's views do not at least reflect there's, the there's views at least of one. the entire tech crew. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's move on and wrap this up with an email or two. Hello. Hello, it's me. Hello. Um, just quickly, do you get my message? Yep. Oh. Hello. <laughs> you can send your emails to the same place, tackpodcast at gmail.com. Joseph writes in and says, Hello, Dills, Garrett, and Jocelyn. Just listened to this week's show, and I had to write in uh, in defense of Buffalo Wild Wings. I've seen a lot of hand-wringing about the prelim locations and a lot of commentary to go along with it as... Uh, uh, basically suggested that it's crazy to have the prelims and a loud and crowded sports bar, which makes me think that a lot of people discussing the location maybe never been to one. I mean, I've been to many Buffalo Wild Wings, but sure. <laughs> Enlighten me, Joseph. I actually have only been there one time, so. Oh. And we and I don't know what I can't, I don't think I've ever been to one, so. Like, I don't often go out and I'm like, let's go get some food. There's a Buffalo Wild Wings right <laughs> over here. <laughs> So it's like it's like TGI Fridays or Hooters or you know I just I don't think of that as a place to go. So I'm just guilty as charged, Joseph. I just find it amusing that that for whatever reason you decided to put Hooters in that same rundown. Wait, aren't they the same thing? <laughs> I mean, Hooters is famous for the wings, right? Ex oh, totally. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I go That's there for the thighs. Go. That's what but, I've heard. Sure. Um, and the articles. And the. <laughs> I wasn't aware that they had a publication. Anyway, Joseph <laughs> continues. I can't speak for all B-dubs locations, but I go to one here in Houston on a regular basis, and I've only ever heard it super loud during the World Cup game between the USA and Germany three years ago. Excuse me. Sore throat. I have a lozenge in. Please bear with me, folks. Do you want me to finish, the, finish this one out? Nope. Storing it in my cheek. Okay. I'm good to go. On Saturdays okay. and Sundays in the middle of the summer, most B-dubs will not be particularly crowded. Also, the location where I go has a separate room that could be partitioned from the general seating area that would keep the noise and distractions down even further. That's all well and good. We don't actually know if they're going to use that room. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's fine. 
I don't know if they're going to do that. That's like saying it'd be fine if they put up a soundproof barrier in the middle of the room, but I don't know if they're going to do that. <laughs> Uh, Anyway, there are a lot of reasons that Blizzard might want to do this. Someone in chat was saying that this could help raise the profile of esports and try to bring it to uh, more into the mainstream. And I think that's a really important point. In Korea, pro gamers play on stage in front of thousands of people. Uh, Professional athletes play in snow and arenas with thousands of people yelling at them. And for the Hearthstone pros to cry about B-dubs being too loud is like cutting off your nose to spite your face. Blizzard is almost certainly getting some sort of sponsorship from Buffalo Wild Wings to hold these events there. And more sponsors can only be interpreted as good for Hearthstone pros. The thing that I do worry about uh, is whether the Wi-Fi can hold up with all of the users hitting it at the same time. If I get up there early, I might start up a Hearthstone game, but I almost always turn off the Wi-Fi and use my cell signal because it's generally more reliable. Makes sense to me that we would at least wait and see how things go before passing total judgment on whether it's a success or not. Anyway, happy clucking. Um... I uh, My biggest concern is also the Wi-Fi for the same reason. It's been awful at every Buffalo Wild Wings I've ever gone to. Um, anyway, your, your, your second to last point about, like, in Korea... I'm sorry, there's no other way I can do this. In Korea, pro gamers play on stage in front of thousands of people. Oh, I had no idea. By the way, we do that here. We do that here in North America. We do that here for Hearthstone at BlizzCon every year. We do it for the, the, uh, the preliminaries. We just did it in the Bahamas. That's not a foreign concept. That's not what I'm arguing Blizzard is doing right. And also to say that Buffalo Wild Wings is on that same level is hilarious. If anything, it delegitimizes esports. It's a joke. That's like saying, oh, a place that has sports on TV. That's a sports thing. Wow, this is now legitimate. That's so absurd. (laughs) Angry Garrett. (laughs) That's, yeah. Let's have it at a Dave and Buster's because that's a game place. You know, I, I, I do, uh, I think he brings up sound points, which is that Buffalo Wild Wings may have paid for the facilities to oh, okay. do something like this, and this was likely done because of some sort of deal. I think all of that is totally valid. I think the problem that we were really having, though, is that, you know, you, Garrett, uh, with Amy, have been running a perfectly fine fireside gathering that did a great job of putting the thing on and are now being told like where to do it right uh rather than just being able to continue doing what you were already doing i think that's really like the bigger issue here is not that buffalo wild wings is some huge problem but just that it's kind of now we're being people are being forced into uh a place that they didn't necessarily want to do this right and that's yeah. kind of an issue. I, I I don't I don't like that. Right. So. I think it almost would have been better if it had been like if there were uh, preliminary locations that had been used in the past for these firesides that had unreliable Wi-Fi that you know didn't work for whatever problems had you know bad admins or you know we've had all kinds of problems over the course of these firesides. Garrett's has not been one of them because it's very well run and very well organized. But if they took some of those problem locations and said okay. We're going to move you to a new location. We're, you know, partnering with Buffalo Wild Wings. They're going to give us better Wi-Fi. We've got, you know, good facilities. And we're going to, you know, give you some help finding some tournament admins. And we're going to do this right. That would be one thing. But taking something that's working and forcing it into another location for seemingly no reason outside of potentially a sponsorship. I agree with Dills. I think that's the part that's the problem is taking something that's working and changing it when there's so many moving parts to these like multiple locations, like I think they had 27 locations or something. And there's always issues with games dropping and all kinds of stuff. So I feel like they should be fixing the broken stuff as opposed to moving the stuff that's working. And also uh, like, by the way, Amy is in our chat room right now. Oh, hi. Uh, And she's giving us some, some information here, which was not available to us, which obviously (laughs) she has because she's, you know, in Runs contact the with Blizzard, button. right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, like, the fact that they're sending noise-canceling headphones, the fact that they're sending uh, Wi-Fi hardware to make sure that the players will have decent Wi-Fi, all of this is great to know. All, none of this was told to anybody, right? Mm. So that, I mean, the, the players complaining about it was really, like, the impetus for us kind of looking at to it and being like, yeah, it. what's up with this, you know? Uh, because they have legitimate, I think, claims. Mm-hmm. of why they're not happy about it. And, of concerns, yeah. Yeah, yeah just cause they're concerns. And you're right, absolutely you're right, uh, Joseph, that things could go swimmingly, and then everything will be great, and we'll all just move on. Nobody would be worried about it. 
but things were going swimmingly before is kind of the issue, right? Like, like depending Garrett on depending Dave on the location, a perfectly fine fireside in a perfectly fine location. Yeah, it, uh, it, and so hopefully we're proven wrong here. But yeah, and, not, and not to and not to blanket statement it too much because there were certainly locations that were not running swimmingly. We were not one of those places though. So we're exactly. we're, we're now in the position yeah, of having something that was not broken, that was working great, and we now just have significantly less control over our event than we did before. Mm. And that's just super bizarre. I, I at no point I wasn't concerned about necessarily the noise. Um, mm -hmm. It was more more about the foot traffic. I mean, that all that all could be 100 absolutely I agree with Joseph. That can be addressed if they have it set up correctly to where the point where, you know, random bystanders can't just walk behind the player or be in uh, a position where they could potentially say something to the player or show them something, you know, whether there's concerns about cheating, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, it just, it seemed strange to me. And I completely 100% vehemently disagree with the fact that this somehow makes it more legitimate. If anything, I think it's a huge joke. But, yeah, there, yeah, there is something about that. yeah moving it to a restaurant that makes it seem a little bit less professional to me. Like professional to me because I know both Dills and I have actually been to the venue that Garrett uses for the fireside because that's where we held our convention last year. So I feel like you know that is very professional when you have a like it's kind of like a IT think tank kind of a location, right, Garrett? Yeah, and if it's I mean our I want to go down that very specific rabbit hole which I was yeah. I was trying to keep it more to the general Sorry. concerns, but <laughs> uh yeah, and it, it was a uh, it used to be a, a a train station that was converted into a mall which is now a a, a, a space for uh tech startups. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. venue with insane internet uh potential in, mm -hmm. in terms of the the speed of the connections there. So yeah, you guys had an amazing venue and, and kind of more my my point is that it was very much in your control and seemed very professional. It was quiet and clean and great internet and all that kind of stuff. And then so to move it from a venue like that to a venue like a restaurant just seems like a little bit less professional to me. That being said, the Toronto Fireside location is actually a like, um, not quite a, but it's a gaming bar, right? So it's but it has like a little secluded area where you know the players are kind of off on their own and so you can do you can do it right in a restaurant bar kind of a setting but um it seems odd to take it from a very professional location to a more um laid back relaxed kind of a setting i guess and maybe again this is them trying to get more into the in tavern bar kind of a, a mentality i don't know but it seems weird to fix a professional thing that wasn't broken by sending it to a more amateur location. Yeah, I think I think part of the part of the discussion here too is what is okay for a, for a fireside versus what is okay for a uh, like a competition. A event. preliminary, yeah, exactly. And and they are they are blending the two, which can work. But there's I'm seeing a lot of conver a lot of conversation from pros saying too, like why even mix this in the first place? How about we just not do that? Um, and obviously I am in the bias circle of, I enjoy going and helping with this. I enjoy being a part of this. And I think you can blend the two. I think you can have a fireside and also provide a space with administrators, uh, for qualified pro professional players to come and compete. Um, but like, I think, I think Buffalo Wild Wings, that's absolutely perfect and fine for a fireside. I don't think it's great for uh, competition. Free limbs. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But um, so I, I think there should be a conversation about like maybe sure push that initiative with fire size, but when it comes to uh, qualifier and and fire sides, maybe go and find a venue like what we already had. Because if I can, if we can find that venue in Florida, I'm sure other regions can <laughs> find that because it's not, we're not exactly known as being a tech hub in Florida. Yeah, I had another point, but I totally forgot it. But it was something about uh, oh. What I was going to say is I agree with you, Garrett, that I think it's probably better from a pro player perspective to keep those two things separate. But I think Hearthstone is very much pushing the firesides and, and pushing the kind of in-person social aspect of the game. And so from that perspective, it's much better to to kind of marry the two together because the having the pro players there is going to be a draw to your fireside. If you take the pro players out of that equation, then, you know, yeah, it's a fireside, but they're, the, you know, the pro players and, you know, getting to potentially meet those people and, you know, have 
face to face with that with them and to talk Hearthstone and play Hearthstone and all those kind of opportunities. That's what is attractive about those firesides that also feature the preliminary. So I understand why they're trying to marry those two, but it's definitely a kind of a fan and greater community based strategy than it is a uh, pro player qualifier strategy. So yeah. it's just who who they're prioritizing here, and it just kind of depends which side like what a player what kind of a player you are as to which side of this argument you're on right yeah yeah and and, and we've spent I, I feel a good amount of today's episode kind of talking about where where blizzard's esports initiative has kind of failed and, or at least fallen short and i will say that one thing i think they, where they've absolutely nailed it and i understand how we've come to this point where they want to mix their qualifiers with their firesides um is with the the tavern hero initiative um you know you can qualify for hct uh, tournaments by playing these ta tavern hero events and those are tied directly to fire sites so in a way i get the through line i get why they want to have at least the qualifiers uh at fireside locations and i think that's good um i just i, I don't love the idea of dictating the venue all right credit given where credit is due moving on <laughs> who's our uh, who's our next email from dills uh, this one comes from Eric. Eric says, many people on the Hearthstone Reddit and myself feel that random spell generation in Mage has crossed a threshold in Ungoro. There are so many ways to get random spells that you can't predict any of their moves. I feel that if, random gen uh, if generating random spells is that powerful, they should have to build their deck a certain way to do it. That's when I had an idea. What if generating random spells was tied to the Reno Singleton mechanic? Reno decks are great but require bomb cards of extreme value to motivate you to play them. Generating random spells has proven itself to be quite powerful in Mage specifically, so pairing the two seems fair. Having only one of each card to then have a chance at cards outside your deck makes some sense. Giving up consistency now to access cards you never would have made into your deck, who never would have made it into the deck in the first place. This could maintain support for Reno-style decks without, throughout the years without overloading Wild with Reno Kazakis-like super cards. What do you think? I mean, sure. Um, I'm trying to figure out, though, what really was added that's being used outside of primordial glyph in ngoro was there is there uh another card i'm not thinking of uh, i'm trying to think specifically well there was the other little elemental guy but nobody really actually uses that mm -hmm. card right so it's still like babbling i don't think ngoro really made the random generating mage that crazy i think we already I think it's had mostly just home there were already so many things, and then when you add Glyph on top, on top of that, I think that's kind of where this email is coming from. Sure, I can see that. Uh, so I, I was watching, uh, just to kind of bring it up, so I was watching, yes, yeah, Shimmering Tempest was the one, um, and Primordial Glyph, that's basically it. So I was watching Dog Stream, and he was talking about why Babbling Book is, uh, uh, and someone in chat saying Mage Quest, but Mage Quest is not even in the meta. Like, people aren't. <laughs> Uh, like talking about like meta decks, no, that's not even in there. People don't play that in competitive, competitive Hearthstone right now. Well, and even uh, then, the quest itself doesn't generate the spells, right? Sure, it just requires you to put a bunch of yeah. random. Well, yeah, no, stuff. but it does incentivize you to play those type of cards. So I get why it's brought up, but yeah, Dills is completely correct. No one's no one's playing that at a high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even then, you don't have to play random generating stuff. You can play like uh, you can play stuff that generates bananas or spare parts <laughs> in wild or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't, you know. The coin counts, right? Like, you don't have to generate a bunch of random spells. Um, but Dog was bringing up an interesting point on why people play things like Babbling Book in tournaments. And one of the reasons why that's good in Discover Mage in general is good in tournaments is your opponents know what's in your deck 90% of the time in Hearthstone. So they know what to play around. And that's a deck that brings into, uh, brings into the game cards that they cannot play around. Right. So suddenly a very, you know, intelligent professional player doesn't exactly know what's in your hand and what's in your deck anymore. Right. So it's really good in a tournament setting to generate random cards. Uh, and I think that's really an interesting thing. I don't really want that taken away, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we've talked about uh, buttoning down the range a little bit. Right. And I think that would be good. So generate the random spell but then show me what the mana cost of that spell is in some mm -hmm. fashion, similar to what Ivory Knight does. Yeah. I don't care how they do it, whether it's reveal the entire card, which I would totally be okay with as well, uh, or just show us the mana cost of the card that you generated. 
I like that a lot more than just getting rid of this generating of random spells. It kind of makes sense to me that Mage is able to do this, right? It's kind of like a ma- you think of a Mage, think of like Cadgar, right? And he's just like <laughs> grabbing a book off the shelf in Karazhan, and he's like, oh, I learned this spell. Level now up. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind up. of a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> the idea of Cadgar cool leveling up is hilarious to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happened in the WoW movie. It did right? happen in the WoW movie. Yeah. That's true. So <laughs> I, I just, I don't. I don't want that necessarily to go away, and I don't think making it into only a Reno-style deck is the answer either. Um, but I, I like the idea of thinking about how this can work better. I don't think it's working perfectly right now. So mm-hmm. I think Eric is right that there's something that can be done. Whether it is making it a Reno-style only thing is is one idea, but I just kind of like, let's just reveal the mana cost to our opponent. Let's give them some idea of what's going on, and then it'll be fine. They just give us more information, or in the future, you, you, there are cards with ranges already. Like it could only be a spell you're discovering, it can only be a minion you're discovering, or there's a sure. mana range given to it. That type of stuff helps as well. But um, yeah, I, I feel like we've mentioned it every episode since uh, maybe the week before on Goro, and I've, I'm, I'm still with it. Let's show us yeah. the mana cost. Show us the mana sure. cost. It, it, it's something to go off of, but it still keeps it somewhat obscured. I really like that idea. Well, the, so the thing that you have to also remember, too, is like in paper magic, you can't compare it one to one with with Magic the Gathering because you reveal the card so that you can't cheat. Right. Like that's really like one of the main reasons why you reveal the card in magic is if it says go into your deck and find a dragon and then you go in there and you find Wrath of God. and You're like, yeah, put Wrath of God in my hand. What up? You know, your opponent's going to be pissed when suddenly and then you're shuffling so they don't even know. Uh, cheating is a very real thing when you're playing a paper card game. So you have to reveal the card so that they know, yeah, I got the card I was supposed to get. Obviously, Hearthstone is digital. It doesn't have to have that happen. But it still is kind of unfortunate that, yeah, you as an opponent are like, well, that could be anything, right? I know it's a spell. That's, <laughs> like, all you know. And that's just that's so broad of a range. So I would like to see it that, that part uh, narrow down a little bit. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, as to uh, the suggestion of making it like Reno, I think that would just kill these cards and make them unplayable outside of Wild, where Reno is kind of the yeah. linchpin in that in that type of uh, in that type of deck. But um, people are trying to do Reno style Priest right now with Kazakus and Standard, but it's just not without Reno that yeah. those decks just don't go. You know, no, it uh, hurts. It hurts. Anyway, final email, Jocelyn. Uh, this one comes to us from Rendon says, Greetings, feathered friends. I recently had a revelation while queuing my mid-range paladin on the standard ladder. I found that after playing 13 plus games in a row, I faced six miracle rogues. I lost to most of them and it felt bad, but I chalked that up to my not understanding the class as a whole and never playing rogue myself. I may come off as biased, but I generally I am generally tired of the miracle rogue archetype. I've been playing Hearthstone since 2014, a few months before Nax came out. And I cannot remember a time when Miracle Rogue wasn't somewhat playable in every meta since I started playing. Hearthstone is my first CCG to ever play, and I have come to love the format of an ever-shifting meta. When expansions release, they come up with the promise of a sh- they come with the promise of a shaken-up meta. Yet Miracle Rogue has somehow survived virtually every shakeup since 2014. I'm not trying to be a hater, but I think Miracle Rogue could be treated like some archetypes that only exist in Wild. Maybe Gadgets and Auctioneer could be added to the Hall of Fame set, kind of like how Freeze Mage lost license. Freeze Mage lost Ice Lance, or how Zoo lost Power Overwhelming. I guess I just want to know what you guys think of the idea. So um, I put a little note in here because uh, Blizz actually did talk about when the Hall of Fame was announced, uh, the reason why they moved Conceal. Uh, they they did consider, the actual quote from Blizzard is, we considered promoting Gadgets and Auctioneer to Wild instead, but in the end we decided to move Conceal because Auctioneer had proven to be one of the most skill-testing cards in the game. We think the power level of Auctioneer decreases with this change, and games where Auctioneer is played will be a bit more interactive. So this is kind of the point that I want to talk to you guys about. So do you actually think, now that we've had a couple of months of Angoro and Conceal is gone, I know we've seen Auctioneer in Rogue, we've seen Auctioneer in Druid, um... Do you guys think that they kind of made a bit of a mistake by not moving Auctioneer out? Or do you like the Miracle kind of decks that we're seeing? I I still don't feel like it's that interactive because they've got so many cheap spells that it's just like, well, if they get an Auctioneer turn off, I just lose the game. So I, how do you guys feel mm. about the kind of Miracle archetype? I like it. I don't want it to go away unless something else is brought in that gives us the ability to do something like it. Mm-hmm. Um at six mana as a four four it's totally a fair card 
And I think conceal was what made it unfair. So I don't want it to go away. I, I, I think right now struggling to find card draw and decks is actually really difficult. I mean, mm. and I also, if, if they were to do something about it, which I wouldn't be opposed to, I would like to see something else brought in. I think that's really the issue for me because it is true that forever we've been using Acolyte of Pain and Auctioneer to draw cards, mm-hmm. right? And it's getting a little bit boring at this point, I think. So maybe so. it's just it's an issue of card draw variety as opposed to sure. specifically Auctioneer being... Because I think, yeah, the Auctioneer did get nerfed and it's I don't think it's an overpowered card necessarily. And I think yeah. we've also seen the Auctioneer turns have moved a little bit later into the game because you can't like with conceal you could play the auctioneer and hide it and then do a big huge spell turn the next turn but now since you can't hide it you're having to wait a few more turns to get yourself some more mana to cast some more spells and actually get that card draw um so it has moved a little bit later in the game but the whole entire meta has kind of shifted later so it still feels very similar right uh yeah i mean but like auctioneer is is it's a dead card against pirate warrior right yes it's a dead card against aggro (laughs) druid it's a dead card against like it's like I don't know the card to me is like not a problem, mm-hmm. um, and 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 for that reason, like the only reason I would want to see it go to the Hall of Fame is like I said to just open up more options for how to do a miracle style turn right or build a miracle style deck. That I think is a very valid reason to do it. Um, but yeah, it's like once it was nerfed, it's it's always been fair since. I get the I get the the sentiment about. When someone's going off on their miracle turn, you're just sitting there watching, and it's it's like a feels bad man situation, and <laughs> you know it kind of sucks, especially like with druid. Like then they innervate, and yeah, then they do more and then stuff, they can just do then, a bazillion things. Yeah, yeah, you're just like, oh my god. But, it's because with Druid, it feels so bad because they've got Wild Growth that they can play on 10, which is a spell. And then they've mm-hmm. also got Excess Mana, which is a spell. And then there's yep. Innervate as well. And it's like they haven't actually had to really commit anything, but they've no. just drawn yep. like four cards. Because well, Excess also Mana have a card, draws a card as well. <laughs> they also have a card that makes it impossible to fatigue, right? Right. So, yes, exactly. So, yeah, so you they're put not all even that taking together. a risk. Yeah. Sure, sure. You put all that together and it's kind of like, yeah, all right. Yeah. If that uh, feels worse than Rogue, in my opinion. Yeah, but I want that kind of engine in the game. Like I, that kind of gameplay, I think, is actually healthy uh, when you kind of pay a lot for it, right? Like to to spend six mana on the card itself on a, on a bad body mm. is is a pretty big penalty, right? So when ten is the total number of mana you can ever have, spending over fifty percent of it just to put the thing into play. Uh, and then the thing is vulnerable because it's a weaker body. I mean, there's there's other options too. I mean, if they don't, if if you ever were to feel like, like I, one thing about it, I think is that the fact that it's a four four and priest doesn't have an answer to it could be considered a problem. Like, what if they made it a three five, right? Like Lyra, right? Yeah. Uh, or Lyra. Like Lyra. Lyra is a really cool instance of this too. You get one cheaper. It's five plus you can play. Uh, the Radiant Elemental and make all your spells even cheaper and then you go crazy. Like, would Priest go crazy? It's almost more nuts than when a Miracle Rogue goes crazy, right? Well, but the penalty there with Priest is that it's drawing random cards. With Gadgetzan, you're yes. drawing from your deck, so you drawing know everything that you get is going to be good. And I think the reason the Gadgetzan is so frustratingly annoying and why the mana cost probably doesn't come up that much is because it's played in two classes that get to cheat mana, right? If yeah. you're playing in Rogue, you've got Prep, which means you can, you know, that's a spell that draws you a card, and then whatever you play as a spell afterwards is going to draw you a card and be cheaper, so you can kind of cheat mana that way. And then in Druid, obviously, we already talked about Wild Growth and Innervate. So I think that's why it's just so frustrating in those classes, because they very specifically know what they're going to get. They're going to be good cards because they're from their deck. They're not random like Priest. And then they're cheating the mana, too. So even the six cost of Gadgets in isn't as clunky as it could potentially be in other classes. Well, but let me let me bring this up, because it sounds like you haven't played as much Rogue as I have when you say that. <laughs> That's Knowing true. that Everyone you're always drawing that. good cards isn't really the case in Miracle Rogue. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think... Anybody who's played Miracle Rogue and has had a hand that's prep, prep, coin, coin, conceal, conceal, understands that yes. <laughs> those cards are really good in certain instances and are really, really bad in others. That's true. So, you can yeah. still draw dead in a okay, Miracle uh, Rogue. You, like that that, that deck draws more dead it. than any <laughs> other deck I've ever played outside of maybe Aggro Druid, right? Aggro Druid, you're out of cards and then you draw an Innervate. Like that, that feels yeah. terrible. But I've played many a rogue game where I'm just like, what the hell am I supposed to do with these cards? 
I can't even put a guy on the board, right? In, in yeah. Jocelyn's so, defense, I think she was talking more about. Okay. I think she was talking talking more generally about the benefit. Sure. You know why Lyra is cost what it does. You know the benefits of random cards versus the benefits of drawing from your deck. I think awesome. was, was more the point you were trying to make, yeah. Jocelyn. Thank you. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not like yeah. putting you down. I'm just saying like there is. There, I'm saying like there is. There is still a significant drawback, right? You put a lot of cards in your deck solely for the purpose of them being able to cycle like that. Uh, and then, yeah, sometimes you get like this god draw where you like prep into fan and then blah, blah, and then coin and coin, and then you drop a giant Van Cleef. But there's still like a lot of times where those cards literally do nothing, right? Where like then compare it to say like a zoo deck where it's very hard to draw cards that do nothing, right? Because they're always just dudes you put on the they're board. They're dudes, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. putting dudes on the board is always going to be something that can be proactive and having a handful of preps and coins and stuff will be, you know, like our backs, you know, you like you do the YOLO prep and hope that it's a spell that comes off the top and it's not. And, you know, like there's <laughs> except for every rogue yeah. I ever play against ever yeah, exactly. preps into a drawn spell and I cry. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they, they moved concealed. They moved auctioneer. I think Miracle Rogue has been hit hard enough. Um, well, they that's the point. They did. They didn't move auctioneer. Oh, I'm sorry. They moved Azure Drake. Excuse me. Azure, oh, okay. Azure, yeah. 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 I'm like, what are you they talking moved about? Azure Drake. They moved Conceal. I think they were hit pretty hard. People have been trying to make it still work uh, with with you know the plant and all that kind of stuff and hallucination. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually was playing Miracle in Wild, and in Wild it's no good. It kind of <laughs> kind of crazy. It kind of stinks in Wild, and that's yeah. that's where I I'm I, I'm mostly in the camp of I'm fine with whatever happens if it stays. I do think it's cool. I like what catch what auctioneer you know allows. If it moves the wild, that's fine too. But the more I think about it, the more I lean towards let's keep it because right now this deck sucks and wild. Yeah. It just doesn't um it does not perform. But it's not fast enough. Like it, wild is wild is very quick these days. Yeah. Uh, but as I, it kind of should be. Right? I also, Unless you're playing an ultra slow controlling deck that can turn back all that aggression, then you then Miracle Rogue is not that, right? Miracle right. Rogue was always the deck that needed some time to get set up. Mm -hmm. And there's no more time. You can only time. you can only bank on awkward draws for your opponent so long. Um, it's yeah. not gonna it's not gonna be consistent enough. But I but at the same time I completely like I really I completely understand where this discussion is coming from. I I really feel for Rendon here. Like it, it's, you start to get this. It's it's easy to get into this conversation of well, why did X get removed when Y is still there? Like, it's easy to, sure. it's, it's almost a, a, like a, a discussion about fairness or like even handedness or consistency in nerfs, Hall of Fame, whatever, what have you. Um, you know, why, why was Handlock nerfed? You know, why is Handlock dead when, when, when Miracle is still here? You know, why is Reno not a thing in standard when, when Rogue is still, or when Miracle is still here? Like, I understand that that discussion but it, i mean the, the boring answer is at the end of the day is is it's it's balanced it's not broken it does it, there are absolutely times where it can feel really bad to lose to but uh, I, and it is skill testing right oh yeah. it's it's not easy to play at all it's one of the hardest i still think it's one of the you hardest wait too long to, to throw that thing down because you're trying to figure out if it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. then suddenly animations happen you're roping and it's, you know mm -hmm. and the the texture of the turn continues to change as cards are drawn so yeah, it's definitely a skill testing card, and that's kind of what they pointed at, right? Was conceal was maybe what made it unfair. Once we remove that, we think it's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I want to make a Dill's analogy. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up fast food and the argument. All you know, everyone everyone goes and makes documentaries where I ate you know X fast food chain every day for a month and look what it did to me. And I would always say, if you ate the same thing of anything every day for an extended period of time, I'm sure you would run into some issues. And to 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 run in here, it really does sound like you just ran into an awful, awful, just bad luck streak where you went up against multiple Miracle Rogues and they were able to to you know beat you, and it, and that feels bad. But I think it would feel bad if you ran into six straight any archetype and that archetype mm. kept winning. I don't think it's specifically Miracle Rogue here is a problem. I think if, if you went up against six paladins and they duded you to death six games in a <laughs> row, that you you would not feel particularly great about uh, Silverhand recruits. Yeah, uh, Ren Rendon does say is my first CCG. Um, and like I, I've played so much Hearthstone. I've run into 
six pirate warriors that all nut drew me and smashed my face in uh, plenty of times, right? And I've never really said, fire your war axe should be nerfed. Like, you, you kind of have to just kind of understand. I've definitely that said that at one point or another. <laughs> I've 100% said that <laughs> it's, at it's some point in my life. It's a very good card, but I think it's, it's there for a reason, and it's, you know. But if anything, like, I think just the um, sheer number of ways they can buff their weapons should be nerfed. But... <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like there's always going to be variants, right, when you're playing a card game where you're going to run into a lot of a deck and it's going to feel really bad. I had I had a night where I lost, I think, like 20 in a row or something like that, and I definitely felt like I'm quitting Hearthstone. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be plenty of feel bad, feels bad man moments in a game like this, but, yeah, it's like just try to look at it objectively and maybe try to think about what, those, what happened in those games and what maybe you could have done differently to kind of combat that strategy, right? Um, Because right now, Auctioneer not being able to be concealed in standard means that there's definitely ways you can combat that strategy. Maybe you you use removal on some other minion and then didn't have it when the Auctioneer hit the board. You kind of always have to be aware of what's going to happen, what's coming uh, next, and make sure that your removal options will line up with it, right? So I think there's there's many things that we could say to you about it, but I think... like honestly, Auctioneer is a totally fair and fine card. If they were to remove it and, and send it to Wild, I would hope there'd be some card that comes in that gives us some sort of a similar type effect that we can still kind of use to make that strategy viable, which is try to draw a lot of your a lot mm-hmm. of your cards, right? I think it's always an important strategy in card games. As long as you're paying a big enough penalty, which I think mm-hmm. you are, right? Uh, yeah. you remember when they said that uh Accolade of Pain was like a two four or something like that? Remember oh that? God. <laughs> oh, good God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the card is like stuff. still just kind of totally insane in certain situations. So. Car- card draw is is very strong. It's it's strong in, in magic. And in magic, you have things like lands, which aren't always useful. Um, sure. In, in yeah, Hearth- it's even better in Hearthstone. It's very yeah. true because you're always drawing a card that does something. It's never mana. Yeah. Right? yeah. So. Well, usually. Sometimes I draw Bloodlust on turn three and I'm like, well, this doesn't do anything. <laughs> but it's a card. But like you know, th- think about uh, you know the what was the card? Um, something in time. Oh man, the card. It was like a seven mana card, but you could use your your graveyard. No, oh, dude, I, you, you don't, I don't play that much Magic anymore. I, I'm useless. <laughs> don't ask me these questions. I was like, I have no idea. Dig so. through time. <laughs> Dig no. through time is the card I'm thinking of. Uh, they actually had to ban that card out in like standard because. Dig through time was just you drew so many friggin' cards and it was so easy to make happen, right? So there's definitely, uh, or treasure cruise, yeah, Maguch is bringing it up as well. Like there's definitely something to be always to be said that you have to look at card draw and the power level of it and be very careful how powerful you make it, right? Um, you know, there's, and you see that the way that they release cards that give card draw mechanics, it always feels pretty expensive. Um, mm-hmm. So as long as it's kind of, in that place where I think we're in a fine spot. Yeah. Yeah. In closing though, I will not be surprised if it goes into the hall of fame next year. Yeah. I think they were very, very kind of conservative with their uh, moving of cards to the hall of fame this time around. But it seems to, at least um, in my experience, it really, that plus the addition of Angoro and the rotation overall, I mean, we have almost an entirely new meta. Lots of different classes feel really good right now. So I think that it's had a mostly positive impact. And so I think that they'll probably be a little bit more liberal with the Hall of Fame with our next rotation happening in uh, the spring of next year. Um, and Gadgetzan might be up for, for rotation at that point. Which at that point, it'll, it will be, you know, 2018 after, you know, four years of, of being in the same sort of a meta yeah. deck. And, and the deck changes a little bit over time just because we have spells rotating out and stuff. But it's still pretty much the same because Auctioneer is neutral and classic, right? So we're not going to see big shakeups in the way that deck plays. We're just going to see some cards coming in and some cards going out, but your core deck is pretty much the same. So I think just to shake things up, they might rotate it next year, maybe the year after, but I think eventually it'll go up for rotation. It definitely kills uh, one archetype, at least, though, if it happens, right? Yeah. It completely kills Miracle Rogue. I think you could still play a Jade Druid, although Jade will be rotating out 
fairly soon Next anyway. Year. Yeah. But. Right. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. It's guaranteed. It's, it, Jade is tied entirely to one specific expansion, and when that goes away next year, it's it's gone. Mm-hmm. But um, well, yeah. But so they, I mean, that they might, might be the time to do it. They might replace it, right? it. Well, yeah. So like they might replace it with a card, and I think the thing is, if they replace it, it's coming in an expansion, which means it's going to rotate, right? So yeah. they can do a replacement, and then it'll rotate out. Whereas right now, Gadget Sands is never going to rotate. That, so yeah. Miracle Rogue itself is never going to change. So if anything, that's the point is that you never want it to be the same forever, right? Yes. So if the card draw engines are constantly shifting, I will definitely be happy with that. I think that might be the way to go as opposed to just leaving Auctioneer in. It'll be yeah, the Auctioneer forever might get super boring. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be the Booty Bay Auctioneer and Ooh. Priest will be able to kill it. Free booty? <laughs> Free booty. I'm in. <laughs> I'll meet you at Hooters. <laughs> <laughs> For the article. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to bring us to the end of this episode. If you would like to write in, tacpodcast at gmail.com is the place to do so. Thanks again to our patrons supporting us at patreon.com slash TAC. Huge thanks to our producers, Declan H. and Peter Williams. You guys are awesome. Uh, find all our back catalog of episodes at amove.tv slash TAC or youtube.com slash amove.tv. You can get an Angry Chicken t-shirt at shirts.amove.tv or uh, some uh, unique etched glassware at etched.amove.tv. Get yourself a coffee mug or a pint glass or a wine glass. I know Jocelyn has quite the collection now. I do. I have all of them. Coffee, <laughs> wine, and pint. <laughs> nice. I enjoy many liquids. <laughs> I'm, I enjoy, all out of a move glassware. I enjoy many liquids. I don't know at what point in my life I started giving a crap about the vessel that I put my beverage in, but I now have it's very, very important. I have very specific glassware for very specific drinks. It, it, it seems dumb. It should. It could all just go in my coffee cup, but whatever. Nope. Whatever the case is, go check it out. Uh, follow the show on Twitter at TAC Podcast and join us live on twitch.tv slash TV every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time for the live recording of this here podcast. Hey, Dills, you're doing stuff other than TAC. Where can folks find you? Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Willie Dills, twitch.tv slash Willie Dills as well. Uh, lots and lots of streaming of Hearthstone. Pretty much all wild this season, uh, although it's been quite a struggle, though I'm at four stars rank five so there's still hope there's still maybe something there you can do it man. Uh, yeah but also uh check out the wrestling podcast i do with justin robert young it's called one nine hundred wrestling you can find it on itunes and all that stuff uh and season four of the dills hearthstone league is coming soon so you'll find information about that on my twitch channel bad ass jocelyn how about mm-hmm. yourself uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch. I'm at Joss Plays. You can also find me right here on Amove TV every Wednesday night for the Gamers In, which is my general gaming podcast. You can also check out my Twitch channel tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. We do a self-help podcast called Slaying Demons. Uh, and the final thing that I want to pimp this week is actually a uh, combination of something for myself and Garrett. We are running a Kickstarter to bring back Embrace the Spoilers for Game of Thrones Season 7. So if you guys like Embrace the Spoilers and you want to hear Garrett and I talk about Game of Thrones, head on over to Kickstarter and help bring back Embrace the Spoilers. Yeah, I set up a, a bit link. It's bit.ly slash Embrace the Spoilers. Um, and, and also a running gag on the show, usually the after show doesn't usually make it in the live show is the fact that Jocelyn's never watched the, uh, original Indiana Jones films, except for half of Temple of Doom. And I don't blame you for not continuing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, one of our stretch goals on there is to make her watch those and then do, uh, some spoiler episodes about that. So, um, wait, I love Temple of Doom. <laughs> I just I, can't stand skull the is the crap one. It, it is it is my it is my belief as an old school Indiana Jones fan that Temple of Doom is actually the worst Indiana Jones movie. Really? I yeah. mean it is it's okay, it's pretty cheesy. He he literally falls out of a plane into the plot. I know. It is there, <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. That's, I mean, that's the one where they eat the monkey brain and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, that's, yeah. don't get me wrong. I used to love if I'm watching it and there's some, like, there's so much pop culture goodness in that movie. There's yeah. so many references that you will understand after having sat through Temple of Doom, but it's not my jam. It's not, By the way, the female character's name in that movie is Willie. It is. It is. And <laughs> she is obnoxious. Your favorite character ever. Little known fact. <laughs> totally, totally majorly known fact. But yes. 
My we should also mention that with that Indiana Jones stretch goal is actually we're going to record a commentary track that you can watch <laughs> on top of Indiana Jones if you want to hear all of my reactions to okay. things firsthand. Yeah. So yeah. if that sounds like something you're into, then uh, yeah, head on over to Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, folks, I'm on Twitter at Garrett Art. Every podcast I do, there are quite a few of them, can be found on amove.tv. And uh, my graphic design portfolio can be found at nomoonart.com. Go check it out. Uh, don't ask why it's no moon art. You can't spell wine's Earl, can you? That's why it's no moon art. So, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Jocelyn and Dills, for carrying me through my, my painful, painful throat. And until next time, job's done. Job's done. Job's done. Yes! Ah, Temple of Doom is good.